star of Bethlehem. Fourteen and a half centuries before the birth of Christ, his birth was prophesied in the book of Numbers. You can open your Bibles to Numbers chapter 24, verse 10, which is where we're going to start our lesson today. The prophecy came at the time of Balak, who was the king of Moab. And the armies of Israel had just crushed the Amorites, an ally of the Moabites. And Balak became extremely fearful that Israel had Moab next on their list. So what did he do? He hired Balaam, you know, that guy that his donkey was smarter than he was. He hired Balaam, or tried to hire him the first time, to come and curse Israel. And Balaam sent the messengers back to Balak after inquiring of the Lord and said, How can I curse people who God has blessed. And, of course, Balak, he was extremely fearful. He, he didn't give up easily. He sent even higher-ranking messengers and promises of even more wealth if Balaam would come and curse Israel. Well, they, Balaam, you know, he gave in to the temptation. That was his downfall, Balaam, was, was the fact that he gave in to the money. The Lord told him, he said, now, if they come and call the messengers from Balak, if they come and call tomorrow morning, go with them. Well, Balaam didn't wait for them to come and call. He rose up early and saddled his ass, and away they went. And that's when the angel of the Lord, standing with a sword in his hand, met Balaam and his donkey on that path. Well, you know the story. They, they built seven altars as, as they got near to Israel. They built seven altars and offered seven oxen and seven rams, one on each of the seven altars. And Balaam said, wait here while I go inquire of the Lord. And he came back and said, how can I curse those whom God has blessed? This happened three times. Each time Balak, the king of Moab, would say, well, you're not trying hard enough. Let's move a little closer and try a little harder. And finally, after the third attempt and the same result, Balaam would say, how can I curse those who God has blessed? And Balak lost his cool, and that's where we're going to pick it up today. Uh, Numbers chapter 24, verse 10. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears. Numbers 24, verse 10, and it reads, And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together in violent anger, in other words. And Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Balaam was only speaking the word of God. And after all, that's what he started out saying. He said, you know, if Balak would fill my house full of silver and gold, all I can do is speak the word of God. That's one positive for Balaam. Verse 11, Balak, the king of Moab, continues, Therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. Balak blaming God for uh, Balaam not being able to be successful. And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers which thou sentest unto me, saying, Verse 13, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own mind. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. That's the sign of a good prophet there, one who speaks the word of God, not his own mind, not his own words. Verse 14, And now, behold, I go into my people. Come, therefore, and I will advertise or advise thee what this people shall do to thy people, the Moabites, in the latter days. Now understand, this is prophecy. When is the latter days? It wasn't at the time of this writing. 
We are living in the latter days. This prophecy applies to us today. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said. Well, his eyes were shut, but now they are open. And what we have here, this is Balaam's fourth prophecy, actually. And what we're going to see is prophecy of Messiah, both the first and second advent. Verse 16. He hath said, which heard the words of God, and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. I hope your eyes are open as well. The reason we came here, sharpen up, verse 17. I shall see him, this is referring to Christ, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. It wasn't time. And remember, there were two advents as well. There shall come a star, note the capital S, out of Jacob, and a scepter as the king's scepter, as to rule as king of kings, lord of lords at the second advent, shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners, this is a, a figure of speech meaning from one end to the other, of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. This is a bad translation. This is not the second son of Adam, but this should have been translated confusion. In other words, Babel, uh, the children of confusion. And, and note this prophecy is to Moab, uh, I should say Balak, the king of Moab. And what this prophecy is, is your people, the Moabites, are going to be destroyed. You know, David, the first man David, King David, accomplished part of that in 2 Samuel chapter 8, where he destroyed all the males of the Moabites. Uh, the next time, though, the second man David, that being, of course, Jesus Christ, the Moabites are going to be completely annihilated, as well as the other enemies of God, as we learn in the next verses. Verse 18, And Edom, this is Rus, Russia of today, shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. They'll gain power and be restored. Out of Jacob shall come he, and the he here, of course, is that star promised in verse 17, Christ, and shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Most of you have a star following verse 17 and verse 19 as well. That star indicates that 99% of scholars believe that this has a reference to Messiah. Certainly does. Verse 20. And when he looked on Amalek, Amalek, of course, the grandson of Esau, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations. Amalek was the first of the nations to attack Israel when they came out of Egypt. Exodus chapter 17, verse 8 will document that. But his latter end shall be that he perish forever. We'll only have one king of kings, one lord of lords. That being the star of verse 17. 21. And he looked on the Kenites, the sons of Cain, if you translate and took up his parable, and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. They think they are hidden and safe there. I think it's a bit ironic that in the Hebrew language, the word nest, do you know what it is in the Hebrew? Cain, K-A-N-E. And we're talking about the, the children of Cain, the sons of Cain, the Kenites. 22, nevertheless, the Kenite shall be wasted. All the enemies of God are going to be destroyed. Until Asher, this is the Assyrian, shall carry thee away captive. The Assyrian, a type for Antichrist, of course. Verse 23, and he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? And you will, beloved you will be alive and doing well. You'll be doing valiantly. Why? 
Because you believe God's word. You believe it's true. You're standing in place with that gospel armor on, ready to do battle against Asher, the king of Assyria, Antichrist, of course. Verse 24, and ships shall come from the coast of Chittim. You know, you know, those of you who have been studying with the chapel any length of time, you know these are the bruisers, God's election. And they're going to be bruising who? The Antichrist through their standing and witnessing against him as the Holy Spirit speaks through them. And shall afflict Asher, that's the king of Assyria, and shall afflict Eber, and he also shall perish forever. The bruisers will be taking names and kicking dragon. All the enemies of God are going to be made the Lord's footstool. Psalm 110 verse 1. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. Now, we were promised a star in, in verse 17. And I think it's a bit ironic that it would be a star that would lead us to that star. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1 as we continue our study. The star of Bethlehem. Matthew chapter 1, let's go with verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. On this wise meaning this is the way that it happened. These are the events that led up to the birth of Jesus Christ. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, better translated. Now, this word espoused can mean engaged. And what this is saying is before they consummated their, their marriage, she was, she was with child from the Holy Spirit. And you know, some would say, well, I just don't believe that that happened. Not one of you would say, I don't believe that that happened because you believe God's word is true. If God's word says it, it happened. And we, we don't second guess it. We believe that a virgin conceived. Now let's see, did, would this be the first time that we heard about that in God's word? Well, if you've read Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it wouldn't be the first time that you heard about it. A virgin will conceive and you'll call his name Emmanuel. Don't doubt God's word, believe it. Verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, a righteous man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily or, or privately. And what this is saying is, you know, here she hasn't been with a man, but she's pregnant. Most people would say she's been with a man. And so what Joseph is doing is trying to defend her reputation and not make a public display of Mary. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph... Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And that conception, the reason that we, the event of the conception, the reason that we gather on December 25th and, and celebrate. It wasn't the day that he was born, it was the day he was conceived. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, Yeshua in the Hebrew, Yahweh's Savior. For he shall save his people from their sins. You have any sins that you need to be saved from? Boy, I sure do. And that's why he came to earth in the flesh, was to defeat Satan, to defeat death, as it's written in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Verse 22, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of 
the Lord by the prophet saying, uh, which prophet? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, of course. That prophecy, verse 23, Behold, a virgin, and that was Mary, shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. If you or, or anyone that you are trying to help find the truth, to see the truth, have trouble with the Trinity, this, this name itself should help. God with us. That, that was his role as Jesus Christ, Emmanuel. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And at that time, Jesus, Emmanuel is his name, the Lord with us, was with us as well as the Lord, and wherever those two are, the Holy Spirit is there as well. That Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. 25, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn. It's ironic that one of the members of the congregation asked me before church today, I have a question. Did Joseph not have, have uh, consummate her relationship with Mary before Jesus was born? And I said, we're going to answer that in today's lesson. lesson and here is our answer. And he, called his, and he called his name Jesus, Yahweh's Savior. Continuing on in chapter 2, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem means house of bread, from which would come the bread of life, of Judah, Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. You know, wise men still seek Jesus Christ. Now, there were several Herods in the Bible, uh, four, I think, in all. This particular Herod was known as Herod the Great. Verse 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews, of Judah, in other words? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, was this some myth or, or some uh, fictitious religious uh, Christian tradition that this star appeared? No. We, we believe that it happened because we believe God's word is true. We're familiar with Numbers chapter 24 that promised that star would come out of Jacob in the east and are come to worship him following that star. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. You see, Herod was the king appointed by the, the Roman government. And one king of Judah was enough as far as he was concerned. If Jesus was the, uh, the king of Judah, that would be challenging his uh, authority as king. So that's the reason he's troubled. Verse 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and of the people together, and here you've got more appointees of the Roman government, not uh, chief priests and scribes appointed by God, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And why is he asking the, the chief priests and the scribes? Well, they should be familiar with the prophets, and they should know where he's going to be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written of the prophet. Well, which prophet wrote that? Micah chapter 5 verse 2. That prophecy follows in verse 6. And thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. The second advent, he will be king of kings and lord of lords. Verse 7. Then Herod, when he had privily or privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. He's wanting to know how much time do I have to work with here. 
And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, this is Herod speaking to the three wise men, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Well, let me ask you, do you think Herod really wanted to know where Jesus was so he could go and worship him? Hardly. What, what happened after this, the events that we're talking about? Herod had every child that was two years old or younger killed in Bethlehem. Why? He didn't want the threat of a competition of another king. No, he had no intentions of worshiping Jesus. His intent was to find him and destroy him, the same as Satan uh, would attempt to do. Verse 9, When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, was this some astronomical fluke? No. We, we believe God's word is true. As early as Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, we're told, what, what are we told about the stars? That they're for signs and seasons. What this star was, was a sign that Messiah was coming. Verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. They were wise men. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense, sense and myrrh. You know, we have in the traditions of men that there were three wise men. Nowhere in God's word will you read that there were three wise men. I think that that saying comes from this particular verse and that there were three gifts presented, gold, frankincense, sense, and myrrh. You know, Jesus himself would refer to himself as the morning star. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 22. Last chapter in the Bible. The words of Jesus begin chapter 22, verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And you know, you have to know the prophecies, the sayings of this book, in order to be able to keep them. And you know, a lot of you I know are like me, that this can't happen soon enough. Behold, I come quickly. Look around the world today, beloved. There's only one who can straighten it out, and that is Jesus Christ. So I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Verse 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. And, of course, you don't worship angels, you worship God. John was taken in the Spirit, as we learn in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, to the Lord's day. Now he's back, but he's thanking this angel that took him there and showed him this thing. But he's going overboard in worshiping him. Verse 9, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, the angel said to John, Don't worship me. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And notice, remember, we started in verse 7. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book, worship God. Verse 10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. How many times have you heard a supposed man or woman of the cloth stand at a pulpit and tell 
their congregation that this book is sealed. This book isn't sealed. The angel said, don't seal this book. The word revelation means to reveal. Verse 11. He that is unjust or, or unrighteous, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, this means morally defiled, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Let him do righteously, in other words. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Now the words of Jesus once again. And behold, I come quickly, or, or suddenly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, note, doesn't say anything about grace or faith there. Grace won't buy you one ounce of reward. What brings rewards are works. And don't take me wrong, faith is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But if you show me someone's faith, and you show me their works better, I will see their faith. Verse 13, again, the words of Jesus. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. All three of these, just three different ways of saying the same thing. Three times for emphasis. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may be, have right or privilege to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Do you know who's going to be privileged to have the presence of Jesus Christ, the tree of life? His election. Ezekiel chapter 44. The Zadok. Those who overcome the Antichrist will have the right to go into the presence of Jesus Christ. What a reward. Verse 15. Remember now we're back in 96 AD in Patmos, which is where John was taken from when he was taken to the Lord's day. For without are dogs and sorcerers, drug pushers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. And there won't be any of these in heaven. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Notice the church is still there. I am the root and the offspring of David, know the key of David, and the bright and morning star. That star that we started off with, the prophecy of it in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. The bright and morning star, verse 17. And the Spirit, notice the capital S, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And the bride say, come. Now who's this bride? You know, if you go back to uh, in, in, in chapter 21, you learn that the bride is the lamb's wife. That is you, beloved, if you are one of his elect. But the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and the elect say, Come, take the truth, receive truth. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. We have the bread of life, Bethlehem, the house of bread, and that living water. But, you know, there's an imposter. You know, it's, it never fails in God's word that everything that we expect Jesus to be, Satan is going to attempt to be the same thing. You remember in, in chapter 19 of this book, Revelation, what is it that Christ arrives on? A white horse, a white war horse. If you back up to chapter 6, the first few verses, you have someone else arriving on a white horse. You have Jesus saying in verse 16, I am the bright and morning star. Most of you know where I'm going, Isaiah chapter 14. There's an imposter you need to know about. I 
Isaiah chapter 14. The early verses of this tell of the, of chapter 14 tell of the restoration of Israel. I want to pick it up, though, let's go with verse 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vowels, uh, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? You know what Lucifer is? In the Hebrew language, it's Hallel. And it means brightness, literally, but in connection with the morning, it's the morning star. He's claiming to be the same thing that Jesus said he was in, in Revelation chapter 22. How is he brought down? Well, if we'd have stayed in Revelation chapter 12, we'd have learned how he's brought down. It's off the boot of Michael, the archangel, when he kicks him out of heaven. That's how he's fallen from heaven. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Verse 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, or in your, his mind, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, above the children of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And the problem with this, the north side is where the throne of God is supposed to be. And I can't help it, I wasn't going to do this, but just hold your place. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Just one or two verses there. Second Thessalonians. Well, I'm not going to read it all to you. You know in verse 1 of chapter 2, it, it's talking about the return of Jesus Christ at the second advent. And Paul says, I don't want you to be deceived about what has to happen before Christ return. And the reason, well, in verse 3, we learn that there has to be a great apostasy, a falling away. Verse 4 is the reason I wanted you to turn here. Who opposeth and exalteth himself. We talked in verse 3 about the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. Now, verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He's going to be claiming to be God. Now returning to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14. I, and this is Lucifer speaking, the, the fake morning star. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Jesus told his disciples, turn with me to Luke, Luke chapter 10, the disciples have gained some numbers, they're, they're, they're now 70, and Jesus sent them forth and gave them power to heal the sick. He gave them power to cast out demons. And they come back from their first excursion, and we're going to pick it up with that in chapter 10 of Luke, verse 17. And the 70, these are the disciples, returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Don't ever forget that condition, beloved You'd be like the seven sons of Siva in Acts chapter 19 if you forget that aspect of it. You remember the seven sons of Siva where they were going to cast out these demons? And the demon said to them, you know, Paul we know and Jesus we know, but who are you? And they all ran from the place naked. And I'll tell you what, Without Jesus Christ, Satan will do the same to you. He will eat your lunch. 
naked, being naked is, is a form of saying that you're stripped. And, and, and you know, those who uh, don't know God's word, what are they going to have for clothing? And rather than a long white robe, they're going to be naked. So uh, don't be caught short of the name of Jesus Christ. That's where the power is. Verse 18, uh, the prophecy, and this is prophecy. And he, this being Jesus, said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And I, can you imagine what they said? What's he talking about? Did, did he just see Satan fall from heaven? You know, he's talking future. Future to even today. You know when this star falls from heaven and it's the fake, the one who comes first, the Antichrist, when Michael kicks him out. Verse 19, Behold I, Christ speaking, give unto you power. This is dunamis in the Greek. Dynamite you can think of. To tread on serpents and scorpions. Who's the serpent in the garden? Satan, of course. Uh, what is the power of the locust in, in Revelation chapter 9? To sting like a scorpion. Do we need to be worried about that? No, Jesus gave us power over them and over all the power of the enemy. Well, I'm talking miraculous, supernatural power included. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing to worry about. Verse 20, notwithstanding in this rejoice not. Don't be happy that you have the power to tread on serpents and, and scorpions. That the spirits are subject unto you but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven, in the Lamb's book of life. You know, everyone is going to worship the Antichrist except those written in the Lamb's book of life, Revelation chapter 13. I want to leave you with two verses as we close. Back to Revelation chapter 8. This lightning that fell from heaven and we're even told more plainly that it's a star in Revelation chapter 8 verse 10 two verses and we're finished and the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp not our lamp and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Now what are these waters and rivers? You've got to understand the symbology of Revelation. Chapter 17, verse 15. We learn that the waters are the peoples. The star, Satan, falls upon the people. Verse 11. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. Wormwood means bitterness. And the third part of the waters, I'm fearful, my beloved, that it's going to be more than a third part of the waters, the people, became wormwood. They became bitter. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. They worshipped the Antichrist, in other words. So we have two stars. We have the star of Bethlehem, the house of bread, the bread of life, from which we can take that water that we'll never thirst again, or you have wormwood. Keep the sayings of the prophecies of this book and you won't be uh, turned to wormwood and bitterness. You won't be deceived by the Antichrist. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word that is so, so powerful, Father. It is so plain and so easy to understand, Father. We thank you for eyes to see and ears to hear, Father. Continue to, to open our minds to receive more of your word, Father. You have a group here that wants to serve you, Father, that wants to help bring about your will, Father. Your will is what is important, not our own. 
be with us this holiday season, Father. We also pray for those who are in our military troops around the world and can't be home because of their uh, fighting and protecting our rights and freedoms, Father. Uh, and we ask a special blessing on each of them and their families through this holiday season. In Jesus' precious name, amen. On CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the mark of the beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Uh, what is it? Verse 6 and the following verses. We learn there that if a parent loves their child, they correct them when they're wrong. And uh, it also goes on to tell us that if God loves you, he chastises you. And, and that's uh, when he chastises you, as we often say here at the chapel, kiss the paddle, thank him for correcting me, thank you for loving me, first of all, and correcting me, and then pick up yourself and get on with it. Uh, you have said that we bring burdens on ourselves, and yes, we do bring burdens on ourselves. Oh, you listed Jeremiah. You're talking about uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, which we're warned by our Heavenly Father quite uh, strongly there that you, one thing you don't want to do is accuse God of placing burdens on you. He doesn't place burdens on His children, but if you accuse him of it, he'll bring the burden that you're accusing him of on you. Billy in Tennessee. We know that Jesus Christ will come in the eastern sky. And where will the false prophet come from? And where will the Antichrist come from? Please explain for me. I'm not sure where you came up with that he's going to come, as you put it, in the eastern sky. Perhaps you mean over Jerusalem, uh, which would be correct, uh, unless you're in China, uh, in which case that would be over the western sky. Acts chapter 1 tells us exactly how and where Christ will return. It's on uh, the Mount of Olives, the exact way that he ascended. Uh, he will descend, and it tells us there. We're not flying away uh, to meet him. He's coming back here. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14 also will uh, form a second witness to Acts chapter 1. You asked about the false prophet, which is the Antichrist, just another title for him, uh, how they will appear. They're going to appear just exactly the way that you think Jesus Christ will appear. Why? He wants you to think that he is Jesus. So you can bet he is going to uh, touch down on uh, Mount Olivet as well. Ray in Arkansas, please tell me when is the next time we're going to take communion. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. There will be a communion service uh, for the television audience in September. Um, and depending on how you watch, most of you, that will be on Monday, uh, the 22nd of September. But be watching uh, for an announcement. We always, uh, at least one day before, usually we try and do it for two days uh, to announce so that you can have uh, the grape juice or the red wine and a piece of soda cracker uh, available so that you're able to participate and take communion with us. We usually have two communion services through the year, one in April at the Passover, uh, one in September, which uh, the meeting time that we call Fall Fellowship, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, if you will. Uh, we don't go out and build booths 
sukkuth in the Hebrew language, uh, as some people evidently do for uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Passover is our only religious holiday, and we try not to take communion uh, so often that it becomes ritualistic. Uh, I think that when people do things and they do it so often, weekly, monthly, whatever, and it becomes ritual, it has a tendency to become ritualistic and, and loses some of the uh, significance or impact, if you will. Christy in Tennessee, what would be the best way to help my parents according to God's word? They are having trouble with their marriage, I want to help. Well, I would pray for them. Uh, I would be a good example of how a uh, Christian uh, lives and behaves. You know, obviously though, your parents are adults. Uh, be careful not to stick your nose in other adults' business uh, unless they ask. It probably wouldn't be uh, welcomed or appreciated. Charlene in New Mexico, I still am not sure on Revelation and where the believers of Jesus Christ will be if we are dead or alive when that time comes. Thank you for your work uh, for the Lord. You're welcome. You know, if, if you are, I'm not really, sh I'm, I'm thinking you're talking about the difference between physically dead and spiritually dead. If you are physically dead, uh, when the second advent comes to pass, the Lord's day, as it's called, you will already be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Uh, if you are physically alive in the flesh when the second advent occurs, you'll be one of two things. You'll be spiritually alive uh, standing before Christ, uh, or two, you'll be spiritually dead, meaning that you've been deceived by Antichrist. And the bad part about being spiritually dead at that point, Revelation chapter 20 will document, you remain spiritually dead for the thousand years, the Lord's day, the millennium, if you will. And you will remain that way till the end of the millennium whereas those who don't worship the Antichrist uh, will participate in the first resurrection, uh, them, the second death, uh, has no uh, power over them. Again, Revelation chapter 20, uh, verses 4, 5, and 6. Martha in Tennessee, are the 7,000 and the 144,000 actual or symbolic numbers? I know they are a lot, there are a lot more. Study with you that know the truth than the 7,000. And of course, Martha's talking about uh, God's election. Uh, the the 7,000, the very elect, if you will, they, they do not ever bend a knee uh, to uh, Baal, as uh, Elijah would call it, um, uh, Antichrist. But, then you have 12,000 from each tribe of Israel that uh, uh, are elect, and that's where you get the 144,000. But the, the number seven in, in biblical numerics is spiritual completeness. In other words, the 7,000 uh, is whatever number that God says is complete. Carolyn and Oregon. Are all the souls that were created at the same time going to be on earth during the millennium? No, I don't think so. Some uh, will remain with God. Uh, I do believe that they, they will remain in heaven with God until Revelation chapter 21 uh, verses 1 through 5 come to pass. And that's when uh, the millennium is over. The great white throne judgment has come to pass. Uh, Satan and those who choose to follow him are in the lake of fire and then God's throne returns to earth and heaven will be right here on earth. Revelation chapter 21 and 22 will document. Helen in Maryland, I would like to know who was the other disciple that was known to the high priest. 
who went into the place uh, with the high priest with Jesus, John chapter 18, verse 15. In my opinion, it was either uh, Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and therefore he would have been known to the high priest. And of course, remember at this time, the high priest was not a high priest appointed by God. It was a high priest appointed by the Romans. So, uh, but anyway, and Joseph of Arimathea is thought to most likely was a member of the Sanhedrin, and therefore he also would have been known to the high priest. Frank in California, uh, we'll leave it at that. Frank in California, uh, Zechariah 13 verses 8 and 9 shows that less than one-third of the population will be saved. Is this correct? No, that's not correct. Uh, in the first earth age, Lucifer drew one-third of the angels to himself. Now in the second earth age, will Lucifer draw more than two-thirds of the angels to death with himself? Then what you're reading there in Zechariah is prophecy that two-thirds will be deceived by Antichrist. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot more than two-thirds uh, because of Re Revelation chapter 13 where it states that the whole world is going to be deceived by the Antichrist except those written in the Lamb's book of life. We're talking about his election. In Matthew 24, 22, you continue, God shortened the days of Lucifer for the elect's sake. Does this mean that given enough time, Lucifer is so clever that he could deceive the elect. I think Jesus wasn't thinking on that line so much as not to put the elect through uh, the persecution of that long of a tribulation. And of course, the three and a half years has been shortened even again. Uh, Revelation chapter nine lets us know that that's been shortened uh, to five months. Cody, and Cody is 10 years old in Florida, and Cody wrote something here, and I'm gonna guess that Cody's mother wrote interpretation, and then rewrote what Cody wrote, and I'm glad you did because I can't read Cody's writing. My name is Cody. I am 10 years old, I live in Florida. I just wanted to thank you for helping and trying to teach my brother, Creighton. He is 11 years old. I just wanted to write you and thank you for talking and teaching on TV. Love and God bless you. Please keep me and all my family in your prayers. And well, thank you for Cody and thanks for uh, keeping us in your thoughts and prayers. We certainly will keep you and your family in prayers. And I'm, I'm glad that you're uh, worried about your brother Creighton there that we're trying to help him but I hope we're helping you as well. We all need a little help from time to time. Roy in Colorado, will you use past tapes from Pastor Arnold Murray or will these be, uh, will there be a second pastor working from time to time with Dennis? Dennis may need a break from time to time, so just wondering, I hope will be continue to bless you all. I hope God will continue to bless you all, and thank you for that. And you know, as long as we're uh, teaching his word and serving him, we can anticipate his blessings. And we appreciate your thoughts, Roy. And the, the current plan is to continue as we have in the past. Uh, I'll teach a book of the Bible, such as we're doing now, the book of Chronicles. Uh, then we'll bring back uh, the recordings of Pastor Arnold Murray's previous teachings. The teaching, the Word, is still alive, and so uh, we will continue to bring those back. And then from time to time, you're right, Dennis needs a break every once in a while because there, you know, there's a lot uh, to running the Shepherd's Chapel network than just doing this broadcast. Uh, it's it's uh, quite an undertaking and a lot of responsibility, but with God's help, uh, we can do anything. 
Don in Georgia, are we all sons of God, even Satan, but Jesus Christ is his only begotten son? And you've got it exactly right. And we're all God's creation, including Satan himself. And you know, none are dead at this point in time. Not even Satan is dead in this point in time. He won't be, and I'm talking about spiritual, excuse me, the death of the soul, the second death as it's called in Revelation 20. Uh, that does not happen until he goes into the lake of fire at the end of Revelation chapter 20. Mike and Connie from Florida, and thank you for your uh, kind comments. Question, what was or is the difference between John's baptism prior to the cross and today's baptism after the cross and resurrection. In Mark uh, chapter 1 verses 4 through 8, we learn that the baptism of John uh, the Baptist uh, was of repentance. He was the forerunner. In verse 8, and it states that John baptized with water, uh, but Jesus uh, with the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's the difference of the baptism between John and Jesus. Today's baptism is of the Holy Spirit as well. I'm out of time. I want you all to know that I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. And you know what? He loves you. Our Heavenly Father loves you when He looks down from heaven and He sees you with the letter that He wrote to you, the Bible, open before you and you seeking knowledge of Him through that letter that he wrote to you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others that are lost in this world of darkness. One thing that's most important, beloved, and it's this, you stay in his word. You know, every day in our Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.